Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to another session. Uh, let's just begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, could one of us please lead us in prayer? Maybe Charles, uh, can you please lead us in prayer? Yes, yes. Let's pray. Go ahead. Father God, we are really thankful and we are really uh, appreciating the fact that you are with us. And as you <clears throat> told your firstborn Israel that don't, re don't forget to tell your children of what I did. Because when you forget what I did, you will forget my, my, my position, my presence. And now we are studying about history, about moves, about about the things you've done in the church, in your body. Lord, I pray that you will create a, a room in, in our hearts, in our minds, in our inner intuity to know what you've done in the church. But you, the same God who did that in the, uh, in the early church, you are the same God who is doing it in the present church. Thank you, Jesus. For a lecture, thank you for everyone that is on the prayer call and they are here to come in. That Lord Jesus, your name will be glorified and that we shall also do according to your will. Thank you for today. I pray for connections, that we shall have a steady connection, that we shall not lose any part, but instead we shall learn so that we will be able to rightly divide the word of truth. For in Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. 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 Thank you, Charles, uh, for leading us in prayer. All right. Good morning once again. Uh, so let's continue from where we picked up uh, yesterday. Yesterday, we looked at Chapter 7, uh, Revival in Our Day. We looked at, uh, uh, you know, the need for revival. Uh, we've been talking about revivals all through the chapters. We studied a lot of revivals, revivals in America and uh, in China, Korea, uh, UK, uh, and we saw that the revivals went all around the world and we studied all of it. But yesterday, what we did was we looked at revival in our day. What is the need for revival? It's not like, okay, God, you've done this in the past. So uh, that's good. Thank you for doing it in the past. Uh, but for now, uh, we are happy with this. It's That's not the attitude that we want. What we want is we want to see the reason for studying all of this is because we know that, hey, God moved in such a way. It is the same Holy Spirit that moved in the early church, even in the early revivals. It is the same Holy Spirit that is working even now. Right. So we looked at the need for revival. We looked at a few points to ignite our passion for God, for his word and his spirit. We looked at, uh, you know, uh, we need to move from glory to glory, from strength to strength um, to see the gathering of the harvest. Remember the latter rain? Uh, we discussed on that how, you know, somebody sows, uh, but the latter rain comes in and there's a greater harvesting of souls. Right. So we were encouraged that. You know, if we are sharing the word with somebody and uh, we don't see the fruit or we don't see uh, anything happening in their lives, don't be discouraged, right? Uh, there will come the latter rain and the latter rain will bring a harvest of souls, right? So our responsibility is to sow the seed. There will be times when we share the word and we will have this, you know, uh, uh, it's a great blessing to see their lives being transformed. And uh, it's an honor to see that. Uh, but at times, we may not see people's lives being transformed. Uh, but we can be encouraged that the seed has been sown and the latter rain will bring the harvest of souls. Uh, then we also saw that we need to see the church impacting the world, being salt and light. And uh, that's what happened in the revivals and and so we want to see that now and then we also saw something very important which was the hindrances to revival right uh, we saw that ignorance was you know one of the main hindrances meaning okay god is you know we we, we can come to a place where you say okay nowadays god can't do this 
right uh, but it's important to understand that god can do it right a misunderstanding of the scriptures and i think one of the most important hindrances uh, or uh, to revival is sin and worldliness uh, the moment you know we are living in sin or if we are uh, in, in the church community and as a church we are living in worldliness what will happen it it immediately becomes a hindrance to a move of god right uh, we looked at that scripture also james 4:4 do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with god right so if we are living a life of sin and worldliness and then we are also praying for revival that's very unlikely that god is going to you know release it through any of that right because if we are still living in sin god will you know this that's that hindrance that will come and so we have to be very clear we need to uh, re- remove sin from our hearts we need to live a life of holiness and uh, we need to live a life just surrendered to god and uh, even as a church right we don't let the worldly influences of the church impact uh, the the church but the church should you know impact the world and so this is very 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 important right uh, now personal life personal prayer personal holiness uh, is very important and it's a precursor to revival right uh, when we see the revivalists those who prayed the missionaries they all lived holy lives they all sacrificed they didn't they didn't live sinful lives and pray for revival they were so consumed by the fact that you know god has to do something in our midst so there was nothing else that was taking precedent in their hearts and minds it was god it was god's work an outpouring of god and so when we come into that mindset uh we are positioning ourselves for an outpouring of god right and a few more uh hindrances that we saw was complacency right uh i'll do it later uh or uh you know uh, i'm satisfied at where we are uh now god responds to hunger right the more we are hungry the more god is uh, responds to that then there's lethargy spiritual laziness right uh, we don't want to make the effort to pray or to press in to pursue god now if we want god to move in our personal lives uh, i'm just giving this example right uh, if we want god to move in our personal lives or as as leaders uh, to you know to equip you in the ministry uh we you know we study the word of god all of it but here's the important thing we need to pray press in and pursue god so that whatever we study it it really becomes truth into our hearts right into our spirit so uh, many a times uh, you know uh, we study the word of god it's happened to me when we study the word of god we know the stories we know everything right uh, but it doesn't become revelation right it doesn't become something that uh impresses in our spirit so that's why it's very important that you know we don't come to a place of saying okay i already know this so uh you know let me let me do something else uh, but we need to press in we need to press in for god uh another important uh, hindrance or a significant hindrance to revival is indifference right uh yesterday uh, one of them asked us question i forget who which student asked me the question but we asked us what is the difference between indifference and uh, uh was that indifference and uh, divisions or divisiveness so indifference is is the system in the church doing this all of them are tuned towards it but maybe we may be uh, saying hey no i don't want to do this i want to do something else right and that call that become that can become a hindrance to revival then there's busyness you know uh we mentioned that uh you know the whole the enemy's number one priority is to keep us busy right uh even in the ministry we can be so busy doing god's work or the ministry 
where we forget about the important things and focus on you know uh, uh, programs events and uh, ministry related work but here's the thing our ministry should flow out of our personal walk with god so uh, so the enemy can very easily remember the enemy is a deceiver he he tries to uh, you know put it in our mind saying hey you're doing ministry work that's okay you're busy you you can't pray uh, anyway you're doing god's work so it's all right and he he's able to deceive but it's very important as believers where we tell the, you know where we are uh, when we keep looking at our personal lives keep pruning ourselves and saying no even though i'm doing ministry even though i'm reaching out to people and ministering to people i need to fill myself i need an infilling uh, i need to spend time with the word i need to spend time in prayer and basically ministry is an outflow of what we do in our personal lives right and so uh, we should avoid busyness right uh, uh, the, you know, one of the things we do in APC is, uh, you know, we encourage our volunteers, we encourage our team members, uh, you know, to take breaks, take breaks with your family. When I, when I say break, meaning take vacations, uh, take time, go out with family, uh, spend time with family. Uh, remember in the revivals that we saw, uh, a few of the revivals where you know they were so busy doing ministry they neglected their own health they neglected their wives they neglected their children many of them lost their uh, children right uh, uh, to diseases and uh, lost their wives now when we study all of this we may feel oh yeah they you know they were willing to sacrifice all of this that's true but if you look at the other side they could have also you know uh, taken time out and uh, looked after their family, looked after their children. And God can always continue the work of the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, so these are certain hindrances, di divisiveness, division, denominational barriers, right? unforgiveness, uh, holding grudges against pastors. Right? Uh, now this is a terrible thing that uh, you know, we should just avoid it. Right? Denominates, unforgiveness. Imagine you've got two, you know, pastors or two leaders. They're not even talking to each other. They can't stand each other. But what are they doing? They both are in the ministry. Uh, uh, you know, preaching and teaching the word of God. Uh, but they hate each other. If you look at the book of John, the whole book, uh, especially f uh, 1 John, 2 and 3 John also, the not three, but mostly uh, uh, one and two, John, we see that love is the essence of the entire book. It says, behold, what manner of love the Father has given us. Right? And so uh, when, when we are ministering to people, we cannot live in unforgiveness and, uh, you know, this whole feeling of division and having grudges and pride and, uh, you know, anger on people. Remember what Jesus himself said. He said, uh, if you're coming with your offering and you have something against your brother, go, make things right. Then you come back and I will accept your offering. Right? Uh, and it's, it's so powerful. Right? So we should avoid divisions. We should avoid causing these divisions. You know, whichever city or uh, uh, nation that we are from, do your best to cause unity and love and oneness uh, among the you know among in the body of Christ so uh, so these were nine hindrances uh, and I'm sure there are more but just nine hindrances here so today we'll pick up from the characteristics of a genuine revival or a genuine move of God what are the characteristics of them we looked at the hindrances and so now there may be many people saying, you know, this is revival or that is revival. But let's study what are the characteristics? What are the main things that we see in a revival? Right. So I'm on page 84. Let's read Matthew chapter 7, 16 to 20. Uh, yes. Could one of us please read that? Uh, Matthew chapter 7, 16 to 20.
Can I read, Pastor? Yes, go ahead, Abdi. Thank uh, you. Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 to 20 says, You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Avni. So this is such a powerful, you know, just a few sentences, but it's so powerful the way the Lord Jesus, uh, you know, just brings out the whole truth here. He says, you shall know them by their fruits. Right. So a good tree will bear good fruit. A bad tree will bear bad fruit. Right. Uh, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Uh, so Jesus is just so powerfully explaining that even in ministry, right, he's bringing the whole concept into life, right, as a whole. And he's saying, therefore, you shall know them by their fruit. One of the things that uh, we can look for in a revival is uh, 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 something that is a genuine work of the Holy Spirit is the fruit that it has, uh, you know, uh, the outcome of the work of, of the Holy Spirit, right? First point, a characteristics of genuine revival. Something of God cannot be manufactured, right? Remember, we cannot manufacture an outpouring or a move of God. Even though we see now, uh, remember the example I shared with you about you know, gold dust in churches. Now, the reason I said that now, there could be places where it's really happening. God is really doing it. But there are places where it's being manufactured. Right? A genuine revival is not, uh, you know, the result of hype, media programs, good marketing, uh, or, or it's not about a charismatic leader. Uh, it's not about some emotional feeling. A genuine work of God is always long-lasting fruit. Right? It always has long-lasting fruit. Right? John 6 and verse 63, I'll just read that. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Right? So we cannot manufacture uh, a work of God. We cannot say, okay... Just because he's doing it, even I will do it. Yes, we can be encouraged with that. Uh, we can pursue God. Uh, uh, but we cannot manufacture. Hey, they are doing this. So even I want to. I want the same kind of thing. I want to manufacture something. I want to make it up, uh, you know, like uh, in my own way. It's not going to last for long. Let me give you this example. Many years ago, I was visiting uh, Andhra Pradesh, and which is an... Uh, the state in India and uh, we were doing like a small uh, you know meeting and pastors conference kind of meeting and uh, uh, during the break we get to speak to the pastors and one of these pastors young man he came up to me and he said uh, pastor you please pray for my pr for my church because it's been five years and we only have about 20 people uh, so I said, yeah, sure, we will pray for your church. But I began to ask him a lot of questions. I said, uh, when did you, you know? When did you start your church? What did you study? Did you do your Bible college, or uh, how did you plant the church? And after talking to him, I got to know that this young man was serving very faithfully in one of the churches close by, and. Um, he would come in the mornings. He said he would open the church, clean the church. You know, this one person would do everything, right? He will put the chairs. He will make the sound system ready. And so when the church starts, everything is ready. And so he was always there in everything. He put his hand and uh, very, very faithful. Uh, and after a few, uh, you know, during the course of time, he was very close to the pastor as well. And something happened. There was a misunderstanding between the pastor and this young boy, young man, right? Uh, 
uh, there was some kind of a misunderstanding. And then he said to the pastor, I will start my own church. Right? Uh, and he felt in his heart that the, the church that I start will be better than this church. Right? So he went, he started his church, uh, uh, you know, close by, very close to the previous church that he was serving in. Uh, and then after that, he, you know, began to do outreaches, praying and all of it. And so he told me the whole story and I asked him, so the reason that you started this church was so that you, this church can be better than that church. He said, no, no, not really. But uh, I, I anyways knew that God is calling me to be a pastor and all of that. But I knew that, you know, it, that was the main reason. And I met, and I told him, take time to make things right before God. No matter what misunderstanding, no matter what uh, has happened, you have been serving faithfully. Uh, he was not given recognition for what he was doing or something like that, that misunderstanding. I said, God has called you so you you're doing things for god people may not recognize you and honor you and all of that but if you, you you if you did this for god god will honor you so go back to your pastor make things right uh, you know i'm not saying close down this church but make things right get your priorities right right meaning Make sure that you're, you're, you're starting this church, not so that you have something, you know, you want the church to become better than his church and then everyone begin to praise you, but have the right priorities, saying that you go back and say, God, I, I, I want to make things right before you, before man and before God. And, uh, and so he did that. Uh, he did that. And a couple of uh, months later, uh, you know, he happened to call me. He said, uh, you know, he, he did that immediately. He went and apologized and made things right. And he also told the pastor, I'm still willing to come and serve, but I feel that this is my calling to be a pastor. So I've started this year. So everything was all right. And then he called me in a couple of uh, uh, months, maybe about five or six months later. And he said, uh, you know, can you come uh, to our church and do like a conference? Uh, I said, okay, but we will have to plan out. And then uh, I think it was about seven months or later, I went to his church and there were about 300 people in the church, 300 people, right? And I was so surprised. I said, uh, I asked him, you were 20 people six months back, six or maybe six to eight months, 20 people. Now you got about 300 odd people, including children. Uh, he said, yes, the moment I went to apologize and I started, you know, uh, you know, just going to God and saying, God, this is what I want to do. This I want to touch lives. Families started coming. And uh, it was such a blessing. So here's what I'm trying to get at. The flesh will profit nothing. But the spirit, the work of the spirit will always be fruitful. Right? Two. In a revival, Jesus is exalted and not an individual, right? A true work of the Holy Spirit will exalt the name of Jesus. Jesus himself said in John 16, 14, that the Holy Spirit will glorify him, right? So the Holy Spirit is the best advertiser uh, for Jesus in this world, right? Meaning... When we are doing the work of God, when God is moving, there's an outpouring, there's a revival, Jesus is exalted. Three, there is proclamation of sound doctrine uh, in a revival. Now, when we see in the early church, uh, in the book of Acts, uh, the believers were established in God. What did they do? Uh, after the Pentecost, Acts 2.42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in breaking of bread and in prayers. So we see that in, a, uh, in a, one of the important characteristics of a revival or a move of God is that there is sound doctrine. Why? Because 
if it is work of the flesh we come up with our own ideas and then we may end up proclaiming a different gospel or we may end up with new ideologies new dogmas being taught and so if the holy spirit is the teacher it is obvious that what is being taught is true and sound doctrine right? so even when we see in a uh, in a revival or a outpouring of god check test and see hey is this doctrine right is it sound is it is it in line with the word of god right uh, so these are some things that we can check does it does it is there a proclamation of the cross is there a call for repentance is there a call for uh, you know living a kingdom lifestyle uh, a call to live as sons and daughters of the most high god uh, so when we see all of these characteristics we will know that this is a move of god another important characteristic of genuine revival is there is unity in the spirit unity in the spirit uh there's a strong sense of brotherly love not just in word but in deed also right what does jesus say he says if if somebody uh, said they love god but you know they curses their brother they're in danger of uh being condemned right one of the most important characteristics is unity of the spirit people are flowing together there is no competition there is no puffing up of one another there is no uh, divisions uh, uh, there is no titles right uh, everything there's unity i right? remember in acts the 120 people praying and the apostles didn't say okay you all said that side we we are the apostles we will pray separately and then you the lay believers those who just come to know jesus uh, you be that side or the apostles didn't say okay we know jesus we were with jesus so we will pray here and you who did not see jesus you you all can pray there there was no division at all they were all in unity in one accord in one spirit right uh and so uh, a genuine revival causes unity right there's unity there's love you know even through the book of acts when we see that uh, people in the church were willing to sell off their properties and help the poor help those who are needy uh, that's going you know way out of our uh, you know comfort zones going way out of our uh, you know limits to be a blessing to cause unity and oneness within the body of christ where the Holy Spirit is moving, there is unity in the Spirit. There is unity in the Spirit. Five, another characteristics, characteristic of a genuine revival is people are brought to intimacy and Christ-likeness. Right? People are drawn to walking closer with God. We don't have to tell them that. Right? We don't have to tell them, hey, uh, uh, are you praying in the morning? Are you re reading God's word? Are you meditating on the word of God? Are you praying in the night? Are you teaching your children? Uh, are you spending time in fasting and prayer? You don't have to tell that. Why? Because people are brought automatically to that place of intimacy. Remember the revivals where, uh, example, the Azusa Street revival? Remember, it's a small corner in the street. And you got thousands of people holding umbrellas at 6 a.m. in the morning waiting to get in. Who puts that in their heart? Who puts it in their spirit? People are drawn to the work of the Holy Spirit. There was no advertisement. Right? The only advertisement was the newspapers. But the newspapers were just saying, hey, there's a revival happening here. But, you know, people are drawn there. People are coming on their own. They're standing there. William Joseph Seymour, the person who led the Azusa Street Revival, he didn't stand and say, oh, please come to church, or you please come here, or, please come for the meeting. Uh, he didn't do any of that. Right? People were drawn to the work of the Holy Spirit. right? Uh, uh, for example, in the Toronto Revival, there was, a, uh, there's a, there was this whole uh, move of God where people who were emotionally, and physically hurt began to receive healing and there was this 
you know, this feeling or this presence of the Father's love that was moving everywhere, right? Different revivals have, uh, you know, poured out different essence of the Holy Spirit. There are times it's the power of God. Sometimes it's the love of God. Sometimes it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's uh, great joy and happiness, right? So these are all the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So he begins to manifest it in its own way and people are brought to intimacy. Very important characteristic of genuine revival or a visitation is that there is long lasting fruit. Right? Like the verse we read in Matthew 7, you shall be known by your fruit. There's long lasting fruit. Right? Uh, we need to look beyond the manifestations. We need to look beyond the preaching beyond the teaching, right? So, uh, for example, the Toronto revival, people were shaking, people were screaming, people were falling on the ground, some are roaring like a lion, some are drunk in the Holy Spirit, uh, just, you know, maybe it looked full of chaos, right? Uh, people are, you know, uh, falling under conviction. Now, through all of this, now we can look at that and say, hey, this is, uh, you know, something that is manufactured or this is something that doesn't look right. We may look at it and say that, but the long lasting fruit will be the best example, whether it is a true work of God, whether there was transformed lives. But if you see in the Toronto revival, there were thousands and thousands of people who encountered God. Many ministries were birthed. It was not something that just was there for one year and then after one year, the revival just died out. No, it lasted for long. There was a ripple effect. Ministries were birthed out of it. Churches began to grow. People began to be transformed. Lives, societies began to be transformed in the Toronto revival. Let's just take maybe two examples here. Nicky Gumbel, uh, I'm sure many of us may have heard of him. He's the founder of the Alpha Course. Uh, Nicky Gumbel, he started his church, right, uh, Holy Trinity Church uh, in London. And he was, you know, just pastoring that church, very few people. And it was his desire to teach people on evangelism. Right? He wanted people to be, you know, believers to be equipped to evangelize with the people uh, around. And so he started like a, a you know, small uh uh, Bible course, and he named it the F Alpha Course. In uh, 1992, there were about a hundred people that were attending. So, how this course is, um, uh, I I'm not really sure whether it was online, but the course is basically it spread out. So you could do it in, you know, for working professionals. You had morning sessions, afternoon sessions, evening sessions, um, and uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, they also will record sessions. Uh, on videotapes and they would have them played and uh, uh, and so they, he was doing a good work about 100 people registered in 1992 and then what happened was uh, Nikki Gumbel visited the Toronto revival and there there was a move of God something touched his life he was empowered there was this whole spark of revival that came into him 1992 93, 94, there were 26,700 students. In two years, from 100 students, it became 26,700 26, students, right? Now, it didn't end there. The Alpha course went on to 160 countries with 35,000 odd courses every year, 15 million students being equipped in the Word of God. And it's a well-respected organization uh, which empowers, which is basically focuses to teach on evangelism. You have courses online and all of that. So, uh, so we see that because of the Toronto revival, uh, Nikki Gumbel visited there and and the move of God, the revival spark came into him, and God began to use him to touch many lives. What started with 100 students went on to 27,700 students. Now, 
the first thing that came to my mind when I read about this was, you know, hundred people to house hundred people is all right. You just get a small room. How do we minister and house 27, 26,000 odd people? How, you know, it would have been a challenge. Practical challenges would have been there, but we see the fruit was lasting. Even now, the fruit is lasting. So if we look back at the Toronto revival and we say, hey, you know, they are screaming and shouting and falling on the floor and, you know, uh, roaring and doing all these weird manifestations. And if we discount them, then we may miss out a true and genuine work of God. Right? Uh, because we see that there was long lasting fruit. Lives were touched. Ministries were blessed. Many lives, uh, you know, many ministries were grew and many ministries birth out of the Toronto revival. Another example is Heidi Baker. Now we know uh, Heidi Baker. Um, many of us may have read books of, on Heidi Baker, uh, founder of the Iris Ministries. Um, a young woman, God called her. She had a burden for uh, people in Africa, children in Africa mainly. Uh, so uh, she went to Mozambique with her uh, husband, Roland Baker, and uh, of course, just like anyone else, uh, it was very demanding, Mozambique, no facilities. She was physically ill, emotionally drained out, uh, going through just a difficult phase in her life, ministering to about 100 children. Uh, you know, uh, finances were difficult, right? They were all children who were maybe orphans, and uh, she had to support and feed them. So it was just overwhelming for her. And then she said, okay, I need a break. And during that time, the Toronto revival was going on. So she said, hey, let me just go for the revival uh, and visit the place. Uh, but the doctors in Mozambique said, you cannot go. You cannot travel so long. Uh, you have double pneumonia. You have many challenges. You cannot do that. It's going to be uh, a challenge on your body. But, uh, but she wanted to see a move of God in her life as well. So she went to the Toronto revival. And at the Toronto revival, Right, she was, you know, as she began to pray, God healed her body almost immediately. Her lungs opened up. She began to breathe freely. Uh, day after day, she gained strength in times of worship, in times of the word, in times of uh, ministry, and uh, you know, she began to gain strength. She spent many hours in prayer, and the team. Uh, the Toronto Revival team uh, also began to pray on her. And then one night she had like a vision. Um, the vision, uh, she felt that she was giving birth. And she's written it in her book as well. Uh, um, and and she felt like she's giving birth. And, and, and then in that vision, she's seeing thousands of children coming towards her and she's saying, God, Lord, no, I can't handle this. 100 is already uh, burdensome for me because, uh, you know, it's difficult financially. And then in the vision, the Lord Jesus says, you know, don't worry. You know, takes out a piece of uh, his body and says, this is my bread. You give it. I will provide. This is, and then gives, takes out a little bit of blood from the body. This is all in the vision. It says, I, the whole point was Jesus was telling her in the vision, I will provide for your needs. You go back and be strengthened in me. And then what happened was when she went back to Mozambique, uh, suddenly the ministry began to grow. You know, she writes in her book, she says there was sudden out, you know, families started coming. Families started asking about God, started asking about, uh, you know, healing and deliverance and all of it. And then she felt, you know, hey, I can't do all of this alone. She would call the team and say, hey, can you send some people here to serve? We need some missionaries or we need some volunteers to help us. And then the big ministry began to grow. Right now, Iris Ministries is a global ministry feeding about 10,000 children each day in Mozambique. And just not about feeding them, but they're also putting in the word of God, teaching them, uh, uh, you know, the word of God. 4, 000, about 4,000 families, uh, you know, accepted Christ. Uh, 10,000 odd churches were being for, uh, established. Five Bible schools, primary schools were started. And so all of this happened after the, during and after the Toronto revival. 
So what can we get at? We should not look at the manifestation and make a judgment on that. But what we can do is look at the fruit, right? Look at the fruit. You know, many, uh, many years ago, and this has happened a couple of times, many people came forward and said they are the Messiah, you know, uh, they are in the form of Jesus or, uh, you know, if we read uh, throughout uh, in the early 90s and also in the early 2000s, we see, uh, you know, many people came forward and they said, oh, I am the Messiah. I am, uh, you know, I did this. And uh, there's one right now, one Australian guy who says that he is the Messiah. And, uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of people who followed them. But there was no fruit. Right? And it just died off. Remember Gamaliel, what does he say to the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Listen, if, if this is from man, it's just going to die away on its own. You don't have to worry about it. But if it's from God, you're fighting against God and you can't fight against God. Right? So here's the important thing. And we understand, uh, you know, the revival, understand the work of God. Remember that we should be known by our fruit. What is the fruit? Right? Uh, maybe sometimes we may look at young people or we may look at certain ministries and say, hey, this is, doesn't look right. So the best way to, you know, you know it's, not, it's not that you're judging, but just the best way to see whether this is of God is to see if there's fruit. Have lives been touched? Have people, uh, you know, uh, families been restored? Have people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus? So these are some of the things that we can look at. Right, uh, Rupa Singh would like to share a small testimony of the Toronto Revival. Please go ahead, Rupa. Uh, Rupa, I think your voice is too low. Uh, can you please increase your volume? Sure, no problem, Rupa. No problem. Okay. So, um, so we will stop here because I don't want to get into uh, next point. Is, so that we'll just uh, we can start that from next week. Uh, but any thoughts? Anyone have any thoughts? Any questions? Uh, uh, until Rupa comes back. Uh, any thoughts? Any questions? Maybe things that you have read, or ministries that you have heard about yes go ahead charles thank you pastor um in the 1930s there was the east african revival that um a certain missionary that was staying in uganda was talking about <clears throat> the use of names and how the names were um, talking about other gods, not the God of heaven, and the the king by that time decided to try to kill him. So he had to run and go to Rwanda. Rwanda is a country south of Uganda, in the southwestern, and then when he was there, God moved him and he started preaching. He, he was a doctor. So... He began in, in, in a hospital in Gahini, a hospital in Gahini, and he preached the gospel. Later, things exploded, and now he came back in Uganda, in the south of Uganda, and they were preaching. And I was um, remembering when you talked about the teaching of the correct doctrine, when the, one of the characteristics of the revival correct doctrine and the doctrine they were teaching was like when you confess sin you must leave it confess sin and leave it don't don't redo it so and god used that and the revival was much in fact even currently the president of the republic of uganda and most of the ministers 
are the children of of the the revival of 1930s and they they are doing well but now the outcomes and the ones who are really struggling because when it reduced in strength people lost way so but the point that i was bringing out was the teaching of correct doctrine uh men were marrying one wife and a wife would be for one man and when you confess of sin then you leave it and then also there was the the, the point of accountability uh you 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 needed to, to be accountable to your to your church to your to your partner to your friend to the prayer group so the, the doctrine was really good and the church was doing well and people were being healed just singing and people demons speak and people are healed so when you are talking of correct doctrine i was like wow this is real it happened here and we are asking the lord that he would pour out again another one so that we would see his move again thank you thank you thank you so much charles for sharing your thoughts it's wonderful All right uh, i'm not sure if rupa is back here uh, rupa would you like yes go ahead rupa is my voice clear sir now yes 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 uh, i was just wanted to share a small testimony during the toronto revival uh, my husband was uh, working in a small, very remote place in orissa as a mission doctor and he sent and there was no television connection in that place and we were we came home to hyderabad for a summer vacation during that time. i don't remember the exact vacation we were at home that time in hyderabad and i was sitting in our uh, living room and i have three children and i was very worried about our second child he was uh, around 3 uh, years old then very naughty and uh, very difficult to manage him and uh, i was just sitting before that uh, uh, a revival i was watching that seeing so many miracles i was sitting there and deep within my heart it, i was crying out to god for that child suddenly the man who was doing that turned towards me and he said there is a woman sitting in the living room and praying for her child son god is saying that he is going to use him for his glory i was really comforted and after many, so many years my ch- son second son david he is studying studying in karatpur iit now and god has uh, he has brought that young man close to his heart and he is serving in that place now and i always prayed because i named him david i wanted to him to be uh, god to according to god's own heart to know the heart of god to love him and to serve him and really god has i am thankful for that young man and thankful to god for giving that promise and also fulfilling it in david's life thank you sir thank you thank you thank you so much rupa for sharing that so wonderful powerful testimony it's amazing how you know the holy spirit can move even through the tv uh, revival that was happening somewhere in a different country and god used it to minister to somebody else in another country so that's so wonderful and uh, yes so we will wrap up this class uh, we will pick up from next week uh, thank you all for joining us let's just quickly close in prayer uh, uh, can one of us please close in prayer uh, maybe christopher if you're around yeah, you please close in prayer oh uh, yes pastor uh heavenly father we thank you for today we thank you for all the learnings we have got we have, we have got from, from today's session and uh, we ask you for the revivals that will happen in our lives in our lifetime are the revivals that we can be that we can be part of that we can that we can participate that we can in some way be a part of and we can make a difference to to other people help other people so heavenly father 
help us in achieving this and let us let us clearly understand that everything comes only from you only from your only from your grace and blessings and we ask you to continue to give us all the strength the courage and the perseverance to continue being obedient to your 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 uh, your uh, 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 guidance and how you want us to lead our lives and what we would expect to to uh, to uh, to happen in the days to follow we continue to ask you to bless us look after us keep us healthy and um, keep us close to you in jesus name we pray amen 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 thank you so much christopher thank you everyone uh, have a wonderful week ahead uh, we'll catch up on monday god bless god bless thank you pastor god bless you too thank you pastor god bless thank you pastor